My next duty is to introduce the next speaker, <clears throat> Jean-Pierre Rosen, that's myself, hello. And um, I'm going to give you a general overview of the ADA language for those who never heard about it before. So unless you have some, any questions about the organization, okay, that's fine. Everybody's got a raffle ticket? Yeah? Okay. Here it is. <laughs> okay. Let's go. Before I start, I'm working for a company called Edalog. I have wrote some flyers too. And uh, so that's a company doing training, consultancy, and etc. about Ada. So you may think, oh, that guy is telling us uh, how nice Ada is because that's his business. Okay? No, in fact, it's the other way around. In a previous life, I was a teacher in an engineering school, and I was, among other, responsible for the teaching of programming languages and compilers. And it's because I thought that Ada was a very nice language that I made my business with Ada. Okay, so it's not because it's my business; it's the other way around. So when talking about Ada, you hear. Um, dates and numbers. Uh, ADA is not an acronym, it's the name of Ada Byron, Countess of Lovelace, and she was, she's famous for being the first programmer in history. She worked on Babbage Machine, if you heard about that, and um, so she she could never run her programs because the machine never worked. However, they were later recorded in Pier 1, I think, and worked right out of the box. So the first program had no bugs, and the first programmer was a lady. We've changed that since. Oops. So, come on. The first version was in 1983. Don't tell me it's very old. It's much, uh, it's much more modern than C, and it's approximately the same time that C++ appeared. So it's not older than uh, most uh, used programming languages to, uh, nowadays. At that time, it's quite... It was quite revolutionary by already having in a well-designed uh, set exception, generics, tasking, and many features that you could not find in the same language. At that time, there was... <coughs> My mouse is jumping. Um, and I think... Yeah. 1995 was a major uh, rework, introduced object-oriented programming, a kind of mechanism, a synchronization mechanism called protected objects, and a way of organizing the various modules of your design into a hierarchy called hierarchical library. By the way, it was the first language that was object, it was the first object-oriented language to be standardized at least at an international level as an ISO language uh, that was about three years before C++. Two or five brought some improvement from other languages especially the notion of interfaces that work mostly like Java interfaces, and uh, also some 
more and more libraries and uh, services that are uh, that are added to the language in the form of extra libraries. Um, in 2012, which is the latest revision to date, uh, EDA was, has been going more formal with contracts, preconditions, postcondition, what is called programming by contract. So it's moving to be more and more formal and more and more not exactly provable, but checkable at trend time for various conditions. So, especially here, it's my pleasure to say that EDA is a free language. It does not belong to any big industry or any uh, major brand. It is, first of all, an international standard and it's entirely controlled by its users. The, the evolution of the language is made by a group from ISO, and uh, those belong to various companies and all work to improve the language. You have free compilers, well, GCC has an EDA version. You know, GCC is a all languages compilers, so what we call GNAT is actually the EDA front end to GCC. And it's like all of GCC distributed as free software. You also have proprietary compilers, well, that's normal, that's a world of business. Many free resources are available and you have a dynamic community, so you have youth group and groups on all the usual um, social media. So, you may think that you don't see much ADA. That's true, but that's because the people who use ADA uh, are not generally those that you see everywhere. I mean, if you take the TIOB index, for example, you'll see EDA completely down in the ranking. Why? Because the TIOB index is based on the number of software on Bit GitHub and the popularity in the social networks. Now, um, Eurocontrol, for example, has 2.5 million lines of EDA. I don't think they are on GitHub. They're not, of course. And when Thales designed civilian and military radars, they're not on GitHub, okay? And the software for the Ariane 6 rocket is not on GitHub, and so on. It's an industrial language, and those people don't put their software on GitHub, okay? So, if, you know, as a physicist, when you measure something, you have to know what you are measuring. The TIOB index is a very good index of the popularity of the languages for hobbyists, but not for industrials, okay? <laughs> so it uh, doesn't prove. So here are a few examples of where you can find ADA software. The TGV has lots of uh, ADA software in it. The A380 and many other airplanes at Airbus and Boeing. The automated uh, metro line in Paris that, that works so well that it has been sold to the American. It's also the system in uh, automated subway of New York. This was the Rosetta probe that explored a comet. It worked for 10 years and then woke up and achieved successfully its mission. This is a brand luxury yacht that has been entirely written in ADA and so on. So why would you use ADA? In general, ADA forbids a lot of things. You know, most languages tell you, oh, our language is very, uh, is very good. It allows you to do a number of things. With ADA, the ADA people will tell you, our language is great. It forbids you 
from making many errors. Okay? It's a language for safety. It's a language for uh, software that works out of the box. So thing, when I hear people complaining about buffer overflows or the, the attacks or those kind of thing, well, this problem has been solved since 1983. So there is no reason nowadays to complain about buffer overflows. If you have one, it's just that you don't, you don't use the proper language. And so, as I mentioned, the idea of ADA is to check as much as possible at compile time. So, when you write something in ADA, in general, it will never compile the first time. The, the uh, compiler will always find something that's not correct in your uh, code. The good news is when you run it for the, the first time, it very often runs out of the box. And that is very satisfactory. Okay, I write something, the compiler helps me run, write the test, run, okay, it works, go to the next problem. So, what's important in a language is not what it allows. What's important in a language is what it forbids. Okay? Because that's where the safety comes from. If you have a language like C that allows everything, well, that's normal. It's a portable assembly language. So, you have to take up the responsibility of safety. If you allow everything, there is nothing you can prove. The only thing you can prove is when you have rules that forbid some, some uh, incorrect constructs. So here is a little picture that summarizes the shape of ADA. You have a big concrete uh, basis. It's a language, the syntax is based on Pascal. ADA was uh, designed after a competitive um, a com um, competition and readability was very important, a uh, very important criteria in that competition. All the languages that made it to the half final were had a syntax based on ADA. On Pascal. Uh, honestly, I don't understand why all the new languages find it obligatory to have a C based syntax. C, don't misunderstand me, C is a very good low level language, certainly the best low level language. The requirements for C was to be a portable assembly. And as a portable assembly, it's very good. We'll see that with ADA, we work at a different level of abstraction, okay? But having a high level language with a syntax of C, I don't understand quite well the, the benefit. Anyway, we will have lots of examples. On top of that, you have a very strong typing system. Uh, I think, yes, that's it. So the uh, typing system is really the backbone of the language. Everything is directed after the notion of types. So m almost every other language appears as weakly typed compared to ADA. So we'll have some examples. And then you have a number of pillars here that are features of the language that serve each a precise goal of software engineering. Packages is the way to split your program into well-defined independent modules. It's strange that few languages address that question of modules. Even namespaces, for example, in C++, uh, a way to control visibility, but you can add anything at any time to a namespace, so there is no control of the modularity of it. Okay, here we have the idea that we build 
an application from software components with someone who provides the software component, someone who uses the software component. Exceptions, well, now it's quite common in most languages, so I assume you know what it is. That's the way of having runtime safety. In ADA, everything that can happen that's bad will be translated into an exception. The requirements were that anything that happens at runtime will translate into an exception. Because when you are writing software for a missile, for example, you cannot run after it and press control alt del okay? The missile has to care for himself whatever happens, okay? So uh, even uh, memory violation in C code, for example, that you call from EDA, will be translated into an exception or uh, an, an IO error or an overflow or whatever you have will be translated into exception. Generics, well, they're a bit like uh, templates in C++, or should I say templates in C++ were inspired from EDA generics. Uh, it's a way to have reusability in the presence of strong typing. If you write an algorithm for a certain type, you cannot use it for another type. So it's a way of parameterizing your software with, uh, so you can use it on various types. Task, multitasking is an integral part of the language, and because it is also used for uh, embedded software, you have a, lot, a number of features that allow you to access the low level without losing the high level approach. And all that is supporting the roof, the programming methodology. That's very important. Ada was designed to support methodology. Now, nowadays some people say, well, it's important to have good methodology. Nobody would dare saying the opposite, of course. However, some people say, well, we have a good design methodology, so we don't care what the coding language is used after that, okay? In ADA, we say, no, why would you stop the methodological effort when you go to the coding phase. If you have a language that actively supports the methodology, which means that you have a direct traceable connection between the methodology and the coding language, then you can trace it all over. And there is also an effect. It's hard to prove, but we uh, witness that every day that if you have a design error in your methodology and your language matches the methodology, then a design error will translate into something that doesn't compile. I cannot tell you how often I've seen people coming to my office saying, well, that damn language, I wrote that, it won't compile. I say, ah, look at what you've written. Is it consistent? Don't you think that there is something that's misguided here? Oh, <clears throat> yes, I'll change that. And when you fix the design error, magically it compiles. So because your types, all the features, matches exactly the object of your methodology. So the idea of ADA is to further the methodological effort into the programming language including now, since 1995, of course, object orientation. And you have the dog houses on the side here that are called special need annexes because not everyone has the same needs and because every ADA compiler is validated against a very uh, difficult validation suite, if you put something in the language, you must provide it. No subset, no supersets is allowed. By the way, I have here the ADA reference manual, if some of you want to have a look. But uh, don't take it, it's fine. 
Um, and although nowadays you have it on the, um, on the web, uh, it's nice to have it on paper sometimes. Um, so, extra services that are not required from uh, all uh, compilers are put into the annexes for special purpose. So, uh, I'll talk later about the distributed system annex. You have some, an annex for real-time systems, an annex for system programming, an annex for um, information systems, for numerics, and so on. So, people who don't care for numerics do not need to bring in all the numeric stuff. That's what it means. So, it, when you look at it, <coughs> it looks like an improved Pascal. It looks very class, uh, classical language. But when you use it, you discover that it's much more different from other languages than the syntax uh, seems to show. Okay, something to understand is the building block approach of ADA. You've heard that ADA was an object-oriented language. You look at the list of keywords. Surprise, surprise, class is not a keyword in that language. Actually, the idea is to make building blocks and to construct paradigms by assembling building blocks. So I'll, sh I'll give you an idea about what it means. You have it, the Lego, the Primobile against Lego uh, approach. If you have Primobiles, you have very nice pictures that are designed for a special purpose and cannot be used for anything else than their intended purpose. They're ready to use, but if you want to make something different with it, it's not possible. If you take a piece of Lego, a single piece of Lego, there is nothing you can do with that. Just that, that's not funny, okay? But if you assemble those pieces together, then you can make very simple things like this one, or very sophisticated ones like this one, or even this. So the ADA approach is to have various building blocks and you assemble them to build your paradigms. So let's see at some ADA. As I mentioned, it's a Pascal-like syntax. So if I have a type color and I want to iterate over, over it, I can say for, say, in color, loop. And every construct, every statement is terminated by a matching and loop. So do you don't have curly brackets, begin and uh, if you have, that you need if you have only one statement and so on. You always have a clear beginning, a clear end. And uh, an interesting property of that syntax is that if you copy a line and paste it somewhere else, it won't introduce syntax error. You cannot say that. Uh, of many other languages. Also, the um, control object, I don't say variable, C here, for example, is considered a constant by the rules of the language. You cannot change it in the middle of the loop, and it's local to the loop, so you are certain that you don't have any remaining value that you use incorrectly after that because you don't have it after that. You also have the usual uh, while loop. You can give a name to a loop. Oh, yes, I have it here. So you can give a name to a loop, and if you give a name to the loop, you must repeat it to at the end, and that's very convenient because when you have several end loop, end loop, end loop, end loop, you can document which loop you are closing. Don't tell me, oh, yes, that's easy. I can do that with a comment. Because you never know if a comment is true. 
while here it's checked by the compiler, therefore you can rely on it. Okay. So you have the usual if, else if, else if uh, structure. You have a case statement, so for the C language people, it's a switch, the equivalent of a switch case. But there is a very nice feature of EDA. Given the type of I, uh, did I mention EDA was strongly typed? Yes, I did. Um, you know all the possible values, because a type in EDA is a set of values with a set of operations. It's mathematically well defined. And knowing the set of value, the compiler will check that every possible value is provided in the various branches of the kit statement. Or you can have a one of those to cover all the remaining ones. And that's a very important feature of EDA. EDA users love that feature. Because in general, you avoid the one of those clause. And therefore, if you change anything in your type, add new values or uh, change it in any way, the compiler will automatically tell you all the places where a change needs to be made. If you add a new value and forget some case statements, it will not silently ignore it. It will tell you, oh, here, you forgot to give me that value. And if the, instead of chasing a bug for two days, you'll immediately fix a compiler error, and that will be all. Okay. <clears throat> also, Ada makes every attempt to allow you to work directly with high-level objects and not go down to loops, into loops, into loops over the individual elements. For example, there is a notation called aggregates. If you want to write the value of a matrix, you can write it directly like that. Okay? You don't have to assign to individual elements. Or for example, here I have a piece of a linked list. So in my head, I create a node initialized by a certain value and the next element is itself a node initialized by a certain value. And, uh, well, we stop there, so the next element is no. You describe globally your structure. You don't have to go down deep in the structure with every element. And needless to say, all the consistency of the values is always checked at compile time. So if there is anything that's not correct, you'll know immediately. So, I said strong typing. What does it mean? Imagine I have the age, the age of a person. Well, when you design a type, types in ADA are abstractions of real world objects. Well, you cannot add the age of a person to a number of flows. It's meaningless, okay? So in EDA, you define a type, and every type is different. If you have here something that says, what say you? Right? if it says type is, it's always a different type that's incompatible with any other type. So we have, if I have the age of a person, and the number of floors in a building, I can use the appropriate values here, but if I, can, if I try to mix them up, it will simply not compile. Tell that to a six years old boy, and it will, he will look at you with glass eyes, saying, well, it's been a certain number of years, even at that age that he's been told that you don't uh, mix apple and orange. But ADA is the only language that allows you to check that at uh, compile time at language level. 
So the idea, when you design a software, okay, you should always do it this way. First, you model the problem space. There you have edges, you have flaws, you have things like that, okay? And then you have to map those high-level types to a machine level where you have only byte, int, and things like that. That's the language level, okay? With other languages, you have to do the mapping. Even with supposedly high-level languages like Java, C++, and so on, all the integer types you have are the machine types. So you have to do the mapping. The new thing with Ada is that Ada gives you access directly to that level and therefore, it's the compiler who does the mapping. It means that it relieves you from many portability problems because that level is completely machine independent. Therefore, the compiler chooses, the compiler knows the machine, and it will always choose the appropriate representation for your types. But your types are by nature machine independent. Packages, I mentioned that. We still have seeds. But just be careful with my little wire here. Um, packages are the way to make um, modules with a well defined interface and the main principle is that the user of, a, take it as a library, for example, does not know how it works. And the designer of a library does not know who will use it, okay? So it guarantees the independence of this point of view. So a package has a specification. For example, here I have a color manager and I define a color type as private. It means, okay, I tell you there is a type, it's called color, but I don't tell you how it's, it's made inside. And then you can provide operation. Here we have the, where is it? Here we have the redefinition of operation. So I can add two colors to make an, an, another color or multiply a certain color by a certain density, I announce those properties, but I don't tell how it's done. There is a problem because the compiler needs to know the implementation if you want to be able to use that abstraction using only the visible part. So a package can have a private part where you tell the truth to the compiler but the external user cannot make any use of that private part. It's completely checked by the compiler. And then you have the package body, that the implementation of the package, where you uh, give the actual code for all the provided operations, okay? And an important feature of Ada is that you can use the package as soon as you have compiled the specification. You don't even need to have written the body. Okay? So you can write a specification, then you write the users of the specification. This allows you to check that what you've specified matches the needs of the user. And once you are certain that what you have proposed is what is needed, only then you think about the implementation. So that saves a lot of time because too often people write a lot of code just to discover that it's not what was necessary. Okay? With ADA, you can check it beforehand. Okay, and then, well... You just, when you, use, when you are using one of those packages, 
you must always mention them in a with clause. So every dependence between modules is explicit in ADA, which means that you can have automated makers, I should say, without the need of a make file, and so without errors in the make file. That's something I never had a good explanation about. How do you prove that the make file is correct? <laughs> Well, make files are supposed to have less compilations. Let's face it. Every time you use a make file, if you have a doubt, you say make clean make. Right? That's the, exactly the opposite goal of a make file, which is supposed to save you compilation. Okay. But because you don't know, well, you could as well recompile everything every time. So the idea is to enforce abstraction by separating specification from implementation. And so, as I said, you have no make file. A feature of ADA that, is, uh, that you won't find in many, in most languages, actually, I don't know of any other languages that have that, is the possibility of having parameterized types. They are called discriminated types. So the same way as you could define parameters to a subprogram, you can define parameters to a type. And you see I can have a component here whose size depend on the parameter. Or I can even have case parts where the elements that are part of the record depend on the variant of the parameter. So it's very convenient when you have flexible types like here. It would be a student record. So we have students may have various majors. And if it's in letter, they have a grade in Latin and so on. Okay, so variant record. Yeah. Ah, uh, Object-oriented programming. Be careful, the model of ADA is somehow different from what you can know from other languages. That's where you see the building block approach. We have seen the packages support encapsulation. There is a special kind of type called tag types that support dynamic binding. A class is a type with dynamic binding, which is encapsulated. Therefore, it's a design pattern in ADA. It's a tag type within a package. So typically, that's not very original. I have a widget. So I call my package widget. And I give the type that corresponds to the data a special name that's not required by the language, it's just a good habit, called, for example, instance. So it's a tag type because you have the word tagged here. Okay. And then I can have procedures that work on that. Those procedures that are given in the same package specification as the tag type are what you would call methods in other languages. So Presumably, you've heard of C++. In C++, you define a class with data members and uh, function members. Okay, The function members are the methods. In ADA, if you want, the package plays the role of the class. The data members are gathered into that tag type. And the operations are the methods. So it's not that far away from what happens in C++, except that all the data parts are grouped into the tag type. And then, of course, you can inherit. So you can define a new type as inheriting from 
the type of move, where is my mouse? It's here, so it's inherited from this one. And you can add a visible part or a private part. You may want to give the extra components uh, to leave them visible or to hide them in the private part. So, An important feature of EDA is that object-oriented programming is not related to pointers. Much, most languages allow you to do object-oriented programming only with, uh, with pointers. In EDA, you can write huge programs, including object-oriented ones, without any pointer. Okay? So the, uh, the whole issue of... Uh, Memory management becomes much simpler. So this model gives you an important, dif that's what the important difference between Ada and others. Here I have a hierarchy of those types. And there is a different type called the class-wide type that includes the whole tree. In Ada, we make the difference between a single type called a specific type and the whole tree. Most languages confuse those two notions. And so you can have, for example, if I have a procedure move with a parameter of type with Z tick class, it means it can work on every value from the whole tree, okay? The set of value for the class-wide type is the union of all values from each type that's in it, okay? And so you differentiate with that operations method that are on a single type and class-wide operation that operate on the whole tree. And of course, if I'm calling that move here, at compile time, I don't know which kind of type I have here. Therefore, it will introduce <coughs> dynamic binding. Okay. So time is running. Uh, starting with 205, there are interfaces that work roughly like Java interfaces. You def can define a uh, type as an interface, and they can have only abstract or no operation, by the way, it's small improvement. And every operation that claims to implement that type must provide the operation. And you can inherit from one real tag type and as many interfaces as you want, like in other languages. As I mentioned, every runtime error results in exceptions, and every exception can be handled. So this is the mantra. Once you have taken care of the unexpected, take care of the unexpected unexpected. Okay? At the end of an error program, you can have a when others handler that will catch everything that can happen at runtime. Generics, as I mentioned, are algorithms that work on any data type. So you can say that uh, you have a procedure swap and that you have to give it a type. Is private means it has only the properties known to all private types, which are assignment and comparison. And, and therefore, for every type that matches a certain number of minimal properties, you can, you can uh, instantiate that generic like this. You can ask the compiler to build a procedure swap edge by taking that generic swap and replacing everywhere edge item by edge, okay? But there is a major difference between Eda generics and uh, C++ templates in that generics are compiled, checked, 
and provided that the type or any other thing that you provide match the requirement, then the instantiation is always correct. You see, you don't change. Ooh, you don't check at um, at compile time if it's correct. It works. Okay, I hurry. Uh, so you have tasking. I'm afraid I was a bit slow. Just a word, uh, but the low level. So you can speak. You have here a record. You can specify bit by bit exactly the layout of the record. And therefore, if you change a bit, you keep the high level approach and you get at assembly level exactly what you want. So the idea of ADA is once again that you specify the high level, the compiler takes care of the low level. Okay, I'll have to skip these ones. I mentioned here are the various annexes. And I'll say that really it's very nice. I often develop on my laptop that is under Windows. And I take the code, I recompile, and I put an in, in operation on my Linux box. I don't even uh, run the checks again. Because if it works on one side, it will work exactly the same on the other side. OK, we have a good compiler with good error messages. A number of libraries. So you can check with, you can Google any library space ADA, and you'll find that there is an implementation of it for ADA. So in short conclusion, you might expect that I tell you, use ADA. No, I won't. You are grown up people, you are responsible. I don't have to tell you what you have to do. In conclusion, I'll just say, please, please try ADA, okay? You have free compilers, you have a number of benefits. Try it by yourself. And then you can decide if it fits your spirit or your needs or everything that you may require from a language. Okay. Questions? Yeah? The question is that all this labor time of all the multi bit work, this part of the road was taken with the core already. So I have a question. Well, in a sense, you could define ADA as an industrial Pascal. Pascal was too small. It was designed to be a pedagogical for universities, and it doesn't grow up to be an industrial language. Same thing as you cannot uh, extend a language designed for web to a real-time language, <coughs> if you see what I mean. Okay. Yeah? We, we learned about messages and generics. Is there a way to specify properties of the message that you define, like is there this in proprietivity or symmetry, so that when you implement or instantiate, you know these properties both? Well, uh, associativity is very difficult. Okay, there is a, for the next revision of the language, which is, by the way, scheduled for next year. Uh, there are some reflections about that, but it appears to be extremely difficult, especially if you consider associativity of floating points, for example. That's awful, okay? Um, there, in 2020, in 2012, you have contracts. Mm -hmm. So those contracts are checked as runtime. There is a special subset of ADA that allows much more provable thing called Spark. It doesn't cover the, the whole language, but where ADA will check at runtime, Spark will prove at compile time. But of course, in that case, you don't have the full language because not everything is provable. Okay? Anything else? Okay, fine. Thank you for listening. Now it's time to make the drawing.
So please. One forty one. Who is the lucky winner? If you got it. One one seven. <laughs> okay. One one seven. Here you are. Okay, you're not a beginner. <laughs> Thank you. So, 140, 140. Left already? Four. <laughs> Too bad. Okay, next one. 155. Okay, we spread. And the last one. 156. Here you are. Okay, you've got something from Providence.